Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this panel. My name is Rachel Afi Quinn. I'm a professor of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Comparative Cultural Studies at University of Houston. And I'm here to introduce as chair some uh, pre-recorded interviews that me and my colleagues, Elena Valdez and Charina um, Mayoposo are excited to share with you. We have a second part of this conversation that will take place tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. It's panel 35, where you'll be able to engage with the artists and have your questions answered. Um, this evening, we are going to share with you some of our preliminary interviews on this project. We're developing Elena and Sharina, would you like to say hello before we get started? Sweet. Hello. <laughs> Buenas noches. Hello and bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So our first inter each of the interviews, there's a series of three and each are 25 minutes long. Um, and we have opened up the chat. So we welcome your comments in that space as well. And I'll share the artists uh, links to their website so you can learn more. Um, our first interview is from Elena Valdez interviewing Julia Santos Salomon. Uh, Elena is a, a modern classical languages and literature professor at Christopher Newport University in Virginia. And Julia Sal Santos Sal Salomon is an, one of our featured artists who is a co-founding faculty member of Altos de Chabon, which is the focus of our project in two parts. So thanks for joining us. Nelson and Nelson, thanks for your technical support. You can start the first video. Hello, my name is Elena Valdez, and here today with me is Julia Santos Salomon. Julia, thank you for joining our conversation about the Altos de Chabon School of Art and Design and also your own work. We are honored by your presence. My colleagues will join our live conversation on December 5th at the Dominican Studies Association Conference. So let's begin. I have a first question for you. You are a founding member of the Altos de Chavon School. Could you share your unique historical perspective with us? Oh, that would be my pleasure. Um, I was living in New York City and uh, I went back to Dominican Republic in 1981 mm -hmm. to have an exhibition. I hadn't been there in 15 years and I enjoyed that show a lot because it was in a teaching institution, the Dominican American Institute. And I sat there every day and I got to meet a lot of students and I fell in love with the curiosity of the Dominican students. The last day of that show, a huge entourage came through and it was Dominique Bludorn and Stephen Kaplan and Bevita Leon and about nine people who came to see the show because I had gotten a lot of press. And uh, they introduced themselves to me and said that they were planning a new design school in the Dominican Republic. And they gave me their card and I was intrigued. I returned to New York and saw the day. And when I was back, um, I got calls from them to, mm -hmm come to the office and have a conversation. And you know, I was invited to events that they were having. And when I realized that their office was in the Gulf and Western building on 59th Street, I got very, very curious. Uh, so while there, I realized that Altos de Chabon, the complex you know, had been built just a couple of years before. And thus began my relationship with Alto Sushabu. They invited me to be an artist in residence in 1983. And throughout all of these conversations, um, I was asked if I wanted to consider teaching at the school. Mm -hmm. The school is still literally in construction. And they flew me down there several times and, you know, they're putting the classrooms together and the dorms. And when I saw a location, I really thought, wow, this is a very 
unique place. Mm -hmm. I returned to New York and started a series of interviews. I had six interviews for this job. Mm -hmm. um, it began uh, with Stephen Kaplan, then Dominique Bludor, and then it went to their liaison between Parsons and Chavon, and it called oh, then the director of the fashion department at Parsons. And finally, it culminated with the dean of Parsons School of Design, who at the time was David Levy. And I'll never forget this. We were sitting there and he finished the interview and he said, look, you know, you have a very full life in New York. You know, why would you want to leave New York mm -hmm. and go there? basically was his question. And I was 25 years old and I looked at him carefully and I said, you know why? Because they're my people mm -hmm. and art is my passion and I would want to share my passion with them. And he looked at me, he understood what he was hearing and he said, well, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a rigorous process, but it was helpful to every step of the way understand what the intention was between these two institutions. It was Parsons first affiliate. Mm -hmm. yes. And um, we were three founding teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, Carlos Delgado, who was a graphic designer, he was doing two-dimensional design with the foundation kids. Then there was Maria Kuzbart, who was doing drawing and composition. She came from Argentina through Yale, and mm -hmm. then there was me. And I was the baby. One of the things that I had to understand is that being 25, rather small, and with a small funny voice that I would have to command a lot of power in order to be able to teach. Mm -hmm. I was teaching anatomy and figure drawing, which was very comical because a lot of people just didn't see naked bodies, you know, in a drawing room. And um, I had to completely closed every window, every door, lock everything, because we had all these very curious gardeners outside <laughs> who wanted to peek. And uh, the students, you know, some of them you could tell they'd never seen a naked body, you know, to, to draw before. And I had to kind of mm -hmm. overcome where they were mm -hmm. with that and help them become accustomed to it. Now, First year was just the foundation year, but second year I was assigned to teach at the fashion department and I was to be the illustration teacher. Now I had done illustrations in New York for uh, boutiques and stores and they did advertising in the newspapers. So the idea Chavon is located in a cliff and it, it was completely isolated from the closest town, completely isolated from Santo Domingo. And when the students were there, they were really sequestered. <laughs> it was an exquisitely beautiful location. Uh, it really is worth looking it up online. Just outrageously beautiful. And I realized that we were very far from fashion mm -hmm. on that cliff. Mm -hmm. So I requested some fundamental things to get that going. And I asked for some trade magazines and some books. And I asked for Antonio Lopez. Now, mm -hmm. I did that um, as a whimsical, ha, 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 who would ever get Antonio Lopez here? Because I thought, well, here is a Latino who is world renowned. He's in this field. And boy, what a kind of impact would he have with Latin kids? Mm -hmm. And I have to credit the school. It took them two years, but they brought him down. And it was life-changing. 
Mm -hmm. Just for me, I worked with him and, and Juan Ramos, teaching the workshops, doing the critiques, getting the models, the, the fundamental structure of the workshops uh, I was involved with. But every person who took those classes were absolutely changed. So that was a life-changing experience. When I was in the classroom as a fashion illustrator, it was my job to prepare these kids who were taking two years, because it was a two-year associate's degree, mm -hmm. and prepare them for their junior year in Parsons. Now, junior year is the most demanding year, conceptually, at mm -hmm. Parsons. You have to have not only a lot of skills, to be able to communicate what you're doing, but you also have to have your creativity completely open. Mm -hmm. That's right. Senior year, you're doing your portfolio, you're doing the fashion show. It's more like finishing touches, but the meat and potatoes was the junior year. So my job was to take these kids from an island and get them ready to jump into a hotbed in New York. Now what happens? Parsons was a very competitive school and the fashion department was the most competitive department. So I knew what they had to jump and transition into. So I spent a lot of time in the fashion department in the summer. I went there, I saw what they were doing. Uh, I took some of their classes just to understand what they would be asking. And then I came back to Dominican Republic and try to create false pressure. Yeah. Not here I am, we're in a tropical island, it's nice and warm. They don't know how to design clothes for fall. They don't have a fall. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to design winter clothes. They didn't understand winter. So I had to get really creative. I would do things like show them Dr. Shivago, you know, where the, the men's mustaches freeze over and the, they're wearing those big hats, just to give them an idea. This is what winter looks like. Mm -hmm. So I had to transport something that we're gonna be expected to know because there's a lot of fall designing that was going on at Parsons Jr. Year. You know, warm weather clothes, it was a very brief period of design. So I really was grateful to have had the New York experience that I could then bring to them. I had to bring an urgency to it that really wasn't existing. But I was very demanding. It's a very demanding teacher. And I wouldn't take any stories and I didn't, you know, no. Why? Because I knew that they'd be destroyed <laughs> in New York if they didn't have some kind of a backbone. So a lot of them, a lot of these very talented students who were candidates for scholarships were brilliant visually but they didn't speak the language very well. So we spent a lot of time making sure that they could communicate visually. So their mood boards had to be better than everybody else's. You know, introducing their concepts visually rather than with a lot of words. So I have to tell you that those first generations of students that got to Parsons had a tough transition, but then they excelled. Mm -hmm. Why did they excel? The circumstances in Chabon required that they be there 24-7. Mm -hmm. yes. There wasn't much distraction. They lived together. They went to school together. They did their homework together. They had this bubble of creativity, which is unique. I've never seen that anywhere else. Right. So we were able to do 
guest speakers that we were able to do. Now, by the way, about the guest speakers, because of the setting in Chabon, it attracted people you would never, ever get your hands on in New York City. People like Larry Rivers and Nancy Graves and Antonio Lopez. You, you can't just you know say, oh, geez, that's Lou Dorfman. These were like the top of the top, and they wanted to see that place. <laughs> so they get on a plane, they go over there, and the kids had access to these extraordinary brains. I mean, that's what it was like when I was there. Could you talk now a little bit about how being a Dominican of Dominican descent or Dominican York inform your own vision um, in your own work? Well, absolutely. I mean, I left the Dominican Republic permanently when I was 10. Mm -hmm. So that means that my imprinting in my childhood came from the island. Yes. My sense of color, my sense of humor, um, my sense of temperature, mm -hmm. all of that was already in place. So when I came to the States, I adapted and I became a Dominican York, but my reference, my conversation, my vision is always tied to my origin. So when I went back to Chabon, I had not been to the island in 15 years. So what I did was to start painting tropical landscapes, not because I was a landscape painter, but because I was so curious about where I came from. And I wanted to spend time in the foliage and in the heat and with that sky. And I, I spend this time exploring the island. Where do I come from? And out of that exploration came this very important you know, body of work for me yes. that spanned the 80s. That was now all about tropical landscape. And it was a conversation that I was having with the island and with my roots. So... That work was so particular. I had a um, big show there in Alto de Chavon gallery um, in 86 or 7. I forget which one of those years. And it was just this glorious moment because all the paintings were on the wall. I had a lot of plants in the show. But what really moved me was that I had brought in not just the art elite mm -hmm. and the villa owners, but I brought in the chauffeurs and the waiters who came with their families all dressed up. And I felt this moment of, wow, look what's happening to me. And look, mental and absolute creative time for me. And um, those years followed me when I returned to New York. Mm -hmm. So the first two years after I left the Dominican Republic, I was still painting tropical paintings. And then it disappeared. Then it disappeared. And that work, that, that work, is still being woven, even though my work right now is extremely different. I'm working with gold leaf. My work is still being woven digitally mm -hmm. into a lot of new images because it just, it's like a stamp of where I come from. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to answer, um, to talk about the community that was created in Chamon. Of course. Um, we formed 
an extraordinary community between the students, and the teachers, and I know that I insisted on a certain relationship between them and the art. I insisted that they understand who these artists were. I insisted that they understand that their work had to come from inside of them mm -hmm. because that's how I work. And even though I was a young woman, I understood that was gonna give them their power. And what do they have power? Some of my former students, which include Sherezade Garcia, who has a tremendous career, mm -hmm. they're just at the top of their fields. I mean, they're Chabon graduates. They were, some of them were in Nike designing shoes. Some of them were in Disney. They were just like in places that mattered. So how do you, how do you take that bubble and put some discipline in there, which is what I insisted on. You can't, you can't grow unless you work hard. So I insisted on that, and then they grew, but without losing their own value. Now, when I was growing up in New York as a Dominican artist, I had no community. There was nobody of my generation to lean on or talk to. So I was in this time slot and I sort of fell through the cracks because I didn't have what now exists. Now, so when those generations that I taught returned to New York and had a community, I was able to join their community. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we have some very strong bonds between us because of that. They know who I am. I know who they are. And now we are a community together. And there's a lot of young Chabon graduates. And I call them my grandkids. I said, you're my visual grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Because the foundation of that school of things that began there the ramifications of it still passes on to some of them. And um, I'm grateful to have that community now because it was very lonely to be the only person I could relate to. I had to, I had to go into different ponds mm -hmm. to find my place. But now I feel I have my place. That's, that's great to hear. We have a couple of minutes left, so I would like to follow up with um, one more question. And it has to do with uh, the representation of women's experiences in your work. So how how does your identity of being a Dominican and the Chabonera and the female artist inform that representation? Well, you know, I was, I grew up in a very strong matriarchy. Mm -hmm. And my family, my extended family, it was all strong women, strong women, strong women, maybe a man, strong women, strong women, strong women. So over the last 10 years, I've been making what I call the family narrative. Yeah. And those are busts of the women in my family that influenced me mm -hmm. and who were part of our migration story. Actually, you see that little, that white shape in the back? She's the latest one. That's my great aunt, Octavia, who was my godmother. So I have four generations of these women in my family and it's a continual piece. And uh, the sculptures make way for writing and installations. And now I've started using them digitally. So in my artwork, women are important because that's how I was raised in the matriarchy. And there's one piece that I did as, of myself as a four-year-old, mm -hmm. which is the age I was when my family, my mother left the island. And I have to tell you that little girl 
she's like my ambassador. She's at the, there's a beautiful women's only show right now at the Hudson River Museum called Women to the Fore. And it's 150 years of women making art. And there's 40 of us in that show. And that little girl is in there. She's my ambassador. She goes everywhere. Mm -hmm. And people respond to her because she's saying something. Now, I'm glad she's doing all that work. I think I need to tell you that the intention of doing that work really is to inform the younger generation in my family, the ones who were born here and who don't have the experience in the island that I did. I just need them to understand, you know, that they're standing on the shoulders of four generations of women before them mm -hmm. who, who came here to create something for them. And they so did. I don't want them to forget. Yeah, and they did. Okay, yeah. Thank you again for your uh, invaluable contribution to our conversation. And I'm looking forward to continuing our, our conversation on December 5th. Um, thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Mi placer, a la orden. Our second interview of three um, will be another 25 minute interview conducted by Sharina Mayo Polso, assistant professor of Romance languages at University of Georgia in Athens. And she'll be interviewing artist Sharesade Garcia, who is a co-founder of the Dominican York Proyecto Grafica. And uh, Nelson, please play the video and I will invite you again, if you hear things that excite you or want to comment in the chat, we welcome a conversation there as well. Um, but you'll see these rich interviews uh, uh, have a lot of overlap. Thank you. This project on Chaboneras um, in New York City, and obviously you were the first person that came to mind when I thought about these. Um, for all the reasons that we all know and that you'll be sharing with us, uh, and mostly because you're being a seminal pioneer and many other things. And obviously I also admire you. And this was not staged. This has been in my house for a year in this new home. <laughs> You've been traveling with me since new, from New York. So I always have a piece of you wherever I go. I so um, I'm going to start by asking you, um, if if that's okay with you, what role has Alto de Chabon played in your personal, obviously, and professional trajectory as a migrant um, and a transnational woman artist? And also, what does it mean for you to be a Chabonera? Well, first, it is my pleasure. I mean, it's so nice to be able to catch up with you, and I am so excited about all the work that you're doing. And uh, so it's, I am the one who is honored to be a part of this conversation. So thank you for the question. It's a question that uh, actually we talk about a lot because mm -hmm. um, I've been a very loyal Chabonet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as like I like to say, um, I've been able to find a way to leave one foot there, one foot here. Mm -hmm. I, and, and, and there is a reason uh, to that. I, I was involved in the arts since I was very young. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something that we're talking about seven years old, eight years old, and it, along with my sister. And some of the painters that now they part of the contemporary uh, hostel of artists in Dominican Republic, like, for example, uh, Enrique Yuamiama, uh, Raul Recio, I mean, like, I can, uh, Ines Tolentino, I mean, we, we have known each other forever. <laughs> <laughs> which I love. And so the experience of being Dominican, nobody can, uh, let's say, tell me about it because I am Dominican. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the experience um, of Dominican York came mm -hmm. as a surprise. And mm -hmm. the responsible of this situation, of these events, definitely um, was Altos de Chabon. Okay. Um, I, I come from a family from both sides. Uh, for my mother and my father, then even my generations, like grandparents, they went to study abroad. Mm -hmm. And then they came 
to uh, back to the Dominican Republic. In fact, my father, um, my my uh, my aunts, they all had that, but they always came back. And in my father's generation, for example, in the 60s, it was so much about the idea that they have to uh, help, you know, our, our, our island to become mother, you know, to become, to, to really be able to uh, survive the consequences of the dictatorship and uh, of, the, of the American occupation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was always very involved in politics in my, my house, um, both sides of the family. We very much about social engagement. We, we are into who we are. And that is something extremely important. So when I was growing up, I, I, I there was a sense of openness about like to be an artist. I was always in the arts. So mm -hmm. very soon my parents, you know, um, put me in a art school because that's the only thing I wanted to do. <laughs> and it was, uh, yes, and I and, and since that's part in the family that was something that we love because my mother plays piano, writer, you know, my father draws and, and, and my uncle. I mean, so that was part of the whole thing. That was like something that everybody loved and loved. So mm -hmm. I went to study with Elias Delgado, Professor Elias Delgado, who is uh, from La Vega. Mm -hmm. And uh, an excellent painter, and he had uh, a, a school of art. And his mentality, he had along with his wife a Montessori school. So they also from La Vega, but in the capital. And they were very open about my mother's idea. My mother' I, my ideas of, of me being educated in the arts was like, don't teach her a thing, because you know we don't want her to know anything. We want her to discover. So this is my mother' mentality. Mm -hmm. So. Elias Delgado, also an artist and a, and a teacher, you know, felt like, oh my God, this is exactly the way that I see things. So I, my experience with uh, Professor Elias Delgado was excellent because it was all about this conversation with a real painter, an educator that did not want to mold me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was to push and develop mm -hmm. the way of a child imagination that he thought it was something that we, lose so fast. Mm -hmm. So uh, after that, um, Professor Elias Delgado decided to close the uh, the, uh, the academy. And then unfortunately, um, you know, we had, I had to find another place. And, and then he's like, no, 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 go to Nidia Serra. Mm -hmm. Nidia Serra, one of the most important women painters uh, of her generation, along with uh, Elsa Núñez, Doña eh, Susi de Pellerano, eh, eh, Doña Ada Barcaz, El Madre de la Jiménez. I mean, we have, it is important to note in this conversation that the art in the Dominican Republic is shaped in a timeline. We can go even with Celeste Wosie Hill, you know, uh, mm -hmm. how important is the, the, the painters, female painters, you know, for the history of the, of, the, uh, of the arts. So I was lucky enough to work with Nidia Serra. So mm -hmm. Nidia took me to uh, a book fairs. Um, in, the, in the 70s, there were a lot of um, things uh, happening. A lot of people came from, you know, studying abroad, trying to do things in Santo Domingo, theater, La Casa de Teatro, it was always there, mm -hmm. you know? So we were like, it was like explosion of, of, of in, in, in initiative you know, cultural initiative. So I was part of that. So I just started doing murals, along with my sister, Liliana Emilia, and Raul Recio. We used to do murals for the uh, Feria del Libro, um, and all kind of fairs, <laughs> everything we were involved. And I started doing pre-making. Uh, she, she taught me how to do um, a linoleum cut, and also she was doing uh, stained glasses for church for churches. So I also learned how to do all that. So I was very... You know, I, I was, it was a very rich mm -hmm. childhood. So then when it's time to decide, you know, I, I had to go to Europe to study. When it was time, why? Because think about it. Our relationship with the United States, especially after the occupation of 1965, you know, this is still healing. <laughs> We are still, the conversations, we, their conversations we still need to have. So then, you know, I came from that, from that consequence. So I'm like, you know, it was like Europe, until, <laughs> until locally, <laughs> my father, who was doing a project, my father is also an engineer and a, and a designer. He designed dishes. So Papa was having a meeting in Chabon when they were doing the, they were finishing the project. And my father said, you know, that school there is excellent. Let's go together so you can see it by yourself. 
because I really, really liked what I saw, what they thinking, because Papa met um, Leopoldo Male, who was the first director of the yeah. of Alto de Chabon. Mm -hmm. So Papa, you know, he's, he's super personable and mm -hmm. very charismatic and an excellent artist. So he, you know, right away, oh, no, 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 tell her to come and show her portfolio, this and that. I went and I saw the office and they sold me, you know, the, oh, there is a whole um, a presentation, like admissions doing every college here too. You know, we have a presentation in the Dominico Americano tonight. But they took me around. I saw the dorms, everything so new, everything almost too plastic, look like a Disney, everything too plastic almost. So anyway, and so hot because it's La Romana, you know. Claro. So anyway, and I remember that very well. So that night, a, my father, my mother, my sister and I, we went to the presentation. That day, my life changed. Okay. That day, I decided not to go to Europe, not to go to the exchange where I was going to do another day of high, another year of high school, like an exchange program, mm -hmm. and then go to Spain to study art. That day, everything. Just oh. like that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to Artos, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be in this school because this school was talking about what I was talking about, and it was about the interdisciplinary experience. Mm -hmm of mm -hmm. like somebody that could be involved in painting, drawing, sculpture, installation, performance, you know, so it was all about that. And it was exactly the philosophy mm -hmm. that, of course, then I learned, you know, <laughs> it was connected to parts of the School of Design. Okay. So then th with that only, you know, Chabon is super important to me. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, during my first year in Artos, because I, I um, you know, Artos de Chabon offers two years. So it's AAS, it's the associate, um, it's the associate degree. Mm -hmm. So then after that, you decide if you want to continue your bachelor in another place. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 uh, I was awarded the full scholarship to come to New York. Mm -hmm. So um, I, my experience, I'm going to say, in Artos, it was like, I remember my aunts and my um, my grandmother, who I always was very, very close, you know, I they would wait for me every weekend because I would come with so many stories about the philosophy of this and that and the history because that, the professors over there were exactly the kind of um, thinkers that I, I wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there was a Maria Kuzbar, one of the most brilliant uh, professors I had, uh, Argentinian. Mm -hmm. um, based in United States, uh, Leopoldo Mahler, who was based um, in England before, I believe, mm -hmm. um, uh, Julia Santos Salomon, my mm -hmm. first Dominican York, who I adore to this day. I had a very close uh, relationship with her. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rafael Alvarez, who uh, now is in New York, uh, a fabulous artist and mm -hmm. designer. Mm -hmm. And so I really was lucky mm -hmm. because I, I, I was exposed to that next step that I wanted. You know, that it was exactly my problem, that it was not a problem anymore, it was a good thing. That it was like, I liked everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and as a Caribbean, I was everything in my skin. So mm -hmm. that made sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that start kind of like becoming that narrative, start becoming more and more and more united, you know, while I had mature. Okay. So when I came to New York, Mm -hmm. I still felt that the United States was not my thing. Mm -hmm. I had an uh, experience of, of being, um, you know, I traveled when I was a leader. So I, I, which is something very important. I was very lucky that we were able to do that. So I, I love go places and all that. I remember Miami and I love a lot of things about it, but I, it, was an, it, it was the idea I had of the United States. And the United States is so diverse. Totally. And it's a continent, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it has so many flavors, which is something that now I, I appreciate and don't take for granted. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I come to New York thinking, well, I finished my two years in at Parsons. I learned English well, you know, and then I travel and I do everything. <laughs> no, 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 no. I fell in love with New York. Mm -hmm. New York informed so much of my work. It was like kind of like, all those little pieces that start being, you know, together around there, but now they are finding that they fit. Mm -hmm. And that fact that I came uh, to study at a very international school, mm -hmm. that it was um, 
everybody from different places. It's like, I mean, we have like maybe two people that were a Spanish speaker, a Cuban, an Argentinian, still friends, by the way, <laughs> from <laughs> 1987, <laughs> you know? And so all that, you know, we came, and then the, the I was the second generation of the Chaboneras, the, the Chaboneros that came. Mm -hmm. So we became like, like a myth, mm -hmm. okay? Super competitive. We came with lots of very good work ethic. Mm -hmm. So we were all about meeting everybody. It was Japanese heavy, by the way. It was a lot of Japanese people. It was a time of, uh, um, uh, in the economy of Japan, and, and a lot of people came, came to study to this country. So we have all these people, and everybody knew los chaboneros. Okay. Even when the chaboneros couldn't speak English. And I'm going to tell you another thing. During my time in Chabon, one of the things that were more important and more surprising in the first generation and the second generation were the different levels of social status. Mm -hmm. the, my best friends that became my best friends and to this day, my, my brothers and sisters, uh, Chaboneros, I wouldn't met them if I wouldn't be an artist. Just because we would never go to the same school, we'll never mingle in the same group of people. Mm -hmm. Because Chabon, to this day, and I'm gonna say to this day, because maybe two years ago when I was talking about it, they told me that they still do. Um, they used to go. And the, the first generation and second was extremely important because it seems to me that it was part of the idea of Charles Bluton. And I'm going to go to back to that because it really um, informs why we were also such a special group when we came to Parsons. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was to, to, to build a place that it was within a high-end tourist place. Mm -hmm. But he said in one of the interviews that he didn't want uh, Artos de Chabon to be a ghost town after the tourists left. Mm -hmm. So the only way, he said, that, he, that anything be, has soul, mm -hmm. such a visionary, he said, anything has soul if you have young people and a school. Mm -hmm. Also, he was uh, very much into the arts. As a matter of fact, he was a collector of Doña Ada Balcácer. Mm -hmm. And he, one of his ideas with the Artos de Chabon Gallery, he was to make that gallery um, like a hub for uh, mm -hmm. all these filmmakers and all these people coming to, to and all these business people to come to, to the island and then have a place with international artists. That's why the uh, first and the school, the school, the artist in residence program was First started. They started with the artist in residence program. By the way, that's where Julia Santos Salomon first got to Artos. And then um, there she met a lot of people, but the idea with this guy was that, okay, mm -hmm. like to find a place and it was full of soul, of young people, of energy. So then all, all that it was very important because when we got to, uh, to the school, all of a sudden we got people that came from neighborhoods that we never heard of because they went to recruit. And the idea, and I thought about with that, with Doña, um, one of the first, the first uh, mission director uh, passed away tragic, tragically in an accident, um, uh, Ruth Vanderpool. Mm -hmm. and, and the uh, scholarship, that is the full scholarship, that is uh, in their years, mm -hmm. is named after her. And then our super dear, new director was Nilda Girardi, who lives in New York yeah. now, and she retired. And Doña Nilda used to tell me that they would go and recruit in places like, like Santiago, but not Santiago, the city of Santiago. It was like places like, eh, look for the artist. Who is the artist in this area? And they would go, they, sh they, they show the work, and that was the portfolio. So we got a pool of just talented people. So when we got to live together in Artos with this very small, uh, think about it, the entire year was 60 people. Okay. The first one was 40. Mm -hmm. 40 people the first year, 60, I believe, my year. What and year was that, Cherisade? Uh, 1984 to 86. Okay. Two, no, those two years. Uh, yeah, and but the beginning was 83. Okay. That was the first generation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, So imagine that. And then that first group that went to Parsons uh, with a scholarship that is before me, the year before me, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it was completely also from different status. There were people high middle class with people extremely poor that they had some family, they were living in a room with some family that they had. And for example, so you have an idea, one of my best friends, one day we realized he was losing weight too much because he was skinny already. And he was walking every day in winter from 181 Street to Parsons, 13th Street on Fifth Avenue. Wow. Because he didn't want to tell anybody that he didn't have money for the token. Mm -hmm. And in that time was the token, not the metal car. Mm -hmm. And uh, But that didn't last long because the moment we realized that, everybody's like, what? No, 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 no. We all, because it was all about this um, community of thinkers and makers. And that is something that it has last to this day from the people that come from Artos to the United States. Mm -hmm. And the thing that is so important for me and why it's so important for me to be a Chaboneda is because not only because I was part of the pioneers, but also because it changed my country. It changed my first island. Mm -hmm. It changed the contemporary art of the country. And not only in the field of fine arts, but also in the field of design. Mm -hmm. In Dominican Republic, people don't have to go to Miami anymore or come or, or, or call Argentina anymore, because we do have talented mm -hmm. designers educated in our country, abroad too, but are working in our country. So that's why for me it's so important to be a Chaboneda and to be part of this breed. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Teresa, and thank you for giving me all that information. I, I, I feel like every time I talk to you, I learn a great deal of things. And oh, I feel very much like uh, about that, like with you too. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be working a lot. So you know, I'm gonna kind of put together the the two questions uh, for the sake of time for us, and we'll continue these dialogues when we do obviously yeah. our meeting within our, our our portion on the fifth. So I wanted to because your work obviously has the Dominican. Your subjectivity is very present in yeah. your work. So to that experience, I wanted to, to ask you what, you know, how does Dominican York identity um, inform the work you do? And do you position yourself as a Dominican York in many regards or not? And, and to that effect, could you talk to us a little bit about um, the, Dominic, uh, the, the project, you know, the Dominican York project Grafica, which to me was Stay very forward. important. Um, for our community and the arts and the way it cemented itself um, as a, I'll call it as an artist organism of Dominican Yorkness, right? And so if you could talk a little bit about that and also you're one of three women um, in, a, in, a, in a collective of 12, if you could reflect a little bit on that because I think that's really important too how how you know those dynamics being one of three women in a group where obviously men are still there are still more men representing the Dominican York arts in that sense. So basically if you could talk about that in the next uh, minutes that we have, we'll appreciate it very much. My pleasure. Um, yeah we, we can talk forever as a matter of fact. <laughs> but um, um, well the Dominican York um, Project, um, not project geographical, that was the collective, but like the, my work with Dominican Yorkness, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, was born without me realizing it, you know, um, way before. Uh, I, I started using Dominican York officially in 2003, 2004. Okay. But my conversation and my, um, and my need to understand and almost double mm -hmm. came very fast and furiously. As a matter of fact, when I decided to stay in New York, you know, I um, I met uh, Josefina Baez, mm -hmm. and Josefina was the person looking for uh, to, to to be together. Everybody, you know, to because she was first here. She she's been here. She so she was one of the people that knew English, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, I found Herman Perez, who also was like always uh, finding ways to get us all together, and I love that. I always loved that. And, and eventually I met my dear Freddy Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so, you know, we were like that. And then during that time, I, um, I, I saw the La Lucha, the struggle that Josefina had of like pushing these, these people that were working in both places. Mm -hmm. And they felt as Dominican as they felt 
York. Mm -hmm. And and the exhibition, uh, and I like always to say that our first exhibition that was Dominican York exhibition, mm -hmm. Dominicans in New York, mm -hmm. um, and Dominica Caras, Dominica Cosas was. Dominicaras, Dominicosas, sí. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it traveled. It went to hostels. It also went to uh, Glassdale um, Gallery um, mm -hmm. in the Bronx. And uh, but the first stop and the place that we exhibited together was the Henry's street settlement mm -hmm. and to me that was extremely important like information because that's exactly the beginning mm -hmm. that is exactly the first step a cultural hub a step a step for the people that came from the experience of ellis island ellis island that whole um you know a flow of people that came in the in, in from uh, 1890 to the 1900s that defined the city of new york mm -hmm. so while being part of there i understood that mm -hmm. i wasn't just a little bit here i was setting roots here and mm -hmm. i wanted it mm -hmm. so that was the beginning you know and then uh, my, my my but my work was already having signs of this idea of the colonialism, the idea of like how I hack the the uh, Eurocentric education that we get, that we get in our countries and we get here. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then um, how to dismantle it, mm -hmm. you know, how to make comments mm -hmm. without attacking, but attacking. Mm -hmm. So there was, it was the beginning. Mm -hmm. So then you know, my my work in 19, you can see 1996, 94, you know, it, it was taking more and more, more and more about the the uh, the connections. I was very much about the landscape. That's where you can see so much of my work with the uh, water. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. It's still very present. It's the connections. And mm -hmm. then the resort and the outcome of those connections. Then this is when you're going to see the Dominican York and the Pan-Caribbean, as I call myself, you know, of people of color. Mm -hmm. that they w came from so many, so many colors that the outcome is always brown. Mm -hmm. Not because they brown, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's because the mix of everything, like the Caribbean that we are, there are so many things together that when we mix it together, it's cinnamon. So cinnamon is the color of the future. So really should be the color of America if this is the future. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's, that, that was very important for me. So during that time, I had this group with Josefina. We never were super formal, but we became a community, you mm -hmm. know, and we were connected. And that's what I made Moses Ross also. So we always were like doing things together. Then I became part of uh, Guacara, another group. But we never had a real vision of doing something together. And this, this when came is 2010. It was a wonderful group of uh, colleagues. We met at the house of Pepe Coronado, mm -hmm. who was a newcomer relatively to um, to New York. Um, he came from Austin. He's mm -hmm. Dominican, but you know he was uh, he came and and he's like, oh my God, you know these artists. And I met him in a, in a panel at Noma, by the way. Mm -hmm. So we like we start talking. I'm like, I got all these ideas. So anyway, so I I get uh, together with Pepe. Uh, Alex Guerrero, mm -hmm. Santa Leon, who was part of many uh, projects, also like um, uh, Quisqueya in the Hudson, was something yeah. that Santa mm -hmm. created that I adore, you know, and uh, uh, Renecito, Renecito de los Santos. I mean, we, uh, Miguel, Miguel Luciano, uh, Dominicano, yo soy Puerto Rican, uh, Miguel Luciano, uh, Luanda. So basically, of the 12, we were like nine, were chaboneros. Mm, okay. So, and then Pepe then came from Austin, and then with the tradition of the Mexican, and I always had got for another reason, <laughs> but he was very sad in that. And then also uh, Alex Guerrero, who came with a Czechoslovakian yeah. mm -hmm. education. And I love that because he will make these wonderful conversations that will engage us in mm -hmm. something that I felt was important and it really, in my opinion, made the conversations and the images in the portfolios, mm -hmm. you know, stronger. Mm -hmm. So, Ileana, that was more conceptual in, in, in the group. Ileana, Ileana and, and Alex were more conceptual and more inventive in the materials. Uh, Luanda, who was more mixed media, she's a master print maker of like the most real stuff that you can imagine, you know? <laughs> you know? And then, so we all came with all these different skills and different uh, experiences 
yet with some over, overlap, overlapping sometimes. And mm -hmm. that it was extremely important. And I think um, mm -hmm. in many ways we created this platform that I think mm -hmm. I can see that the consequences so far have been super positive. Okay. Okay, thank you, Cheresade, because I, I think that it's in the collective of, you know what I mean, of the communities that this amazing group exists, but I I kind of wanted, in, in this conversation, we can bring it on the fifth, because I want, I kind of wanted to highlight the work of Ileana, Luanda, and yourself, not taking any, not taking anything away from all the amazing- No, no, because it's very important. Because I, I am a big admirer of many of the works and I have a few of them hanging here. As you thank can. you, thank you. I'm a big supporter of all of you, obviously. But I think that we want to shift on the fifth to that conversation to talk about the women, because I think the women are terribly important. And, and obviously um, your work um, in many ways, you have been a mentor to many other Chaboneras. Thank you. Uh, including, I think, Dulcina, who's also going to join us. And she talks, I know she talks very highly of you because of the conversations I have with Rachel. So um, <laughs> thank you. I, I yeah, love the new generation. generation. I love the new generation. I, I, I think it's very exciting what they're doing, Joyri and all of these young women. I think we have to support each other. We have to, and we have to keep up this discourse. But, but that's, let's not forget what we talked about before we even started. This is about creating history and creating archive. And this is about trajectories. And this is about something that you've been a big part of because you are terribly supportive and generous to, that's, that's what I can say, to, to, to the Chaboneras, but to the non-Chaboneras and, and academics like myself, you have always opened your doors and your space. So. Um, <laughs> okay, so we have a third interview for you with Dulcina, Dulcina Abreu, and that interview is conducted by me, and it's really exciting. Return to a conversation with her that I started uh, a decade ago when she and I met in Santo Domingo when I was first beginning my research in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and that will be the last interview for this evening, but we really hope you'll join us tomorrow evening for a lively conversation with these artists who are really excited to talk with you and with one another about this legacy, Altos de Chabon. So Nelson, thanks for posting the next. This project on Chaboni. Hi, Dulcina. So nice Hello. to see you. Yeah, so nice to see you too. I'm super excited of being talking to you today. Thank you for your time. And it's really wild to get to be in conversation with you 10 years later after <laughs> I with you for my first book, which will be out soon in the spring. So uh, it's been amazing to just track the work that you're doing as an artist now in the U.S., although I, we first met in Santo Domingo. And so I have some questions I want to ask you today for the Dominican Studies Conference um, coming up this December 2020. So Yes, super yeah. exciting. <laughs> Thanks. My, my first question is actually about kind of your experience uh, transitioning to New York where you studied and how you think about your identity now. We've talked a little bit about this and your relationship to a Dominican York identity and what that means for you. I think like it was like a process of liberation. Um, I think it was a transition, a very, very beautiful transition because my parents uh, didn't have that relationship with New York City, but my grandparents did. And I think I reconnected with that lineage that like I could on like have a long time, you know, interacting with or like learning with. But I did understood like the importance of like Dominican York uh, communities and how important is as well this connection in between the island and New York City. I think like the big machinery behind the city is all Latinx <laughs> and a lot of like immigrants as well, not only Latinx, but these like very specific 
feeling of the city as this like fabric of immigrants and as well gender. Um, I think it was very nurturing to me. I always feel New York as home, even though I grew up and I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. Um, I think like it was very performative to be in the island because society and Christian, like, you know, like it's a basically Christian Catholic a bringing of us by doesn't allow us to like be fully out in the world as we feel so i think like new york city was a uh, sanctuary for me to just like connect with the communities that i wanted to that we were feeling the same as an artist and as well as a person understand the struggle of the immigrant mm -hmm. i think as an immigrant i think it was very important to me to see what my grandparents were feeling, how, you know, like that very pride <laughs> was like, was in their hearts. Mm -hmm. What year was it that you moved to New York to study at Parsons? I moved in 2000, I moved in 2013 mm -hmm. and permanently uh, in 2014. It was a very important time because um, I think like I was like getting inside the fabric and like like com like committing myself to understand that maybe being in the U.S. was my future, mm -hmm. that it was not necessarily my present. Um, I do connected with Sherisada. She received me like in here as a liaison with like Parsons and uh, Chabon, and she was having this huge community of like Dominican Yorks and Latinx uh, artists that it was like impressive because to me, because as an artist in the island, we don't necessarily are doing a lot of like institutional critique or like engagement with, you know, like art that it's like creating change literally in society. So I think this like movement, this transition of like me coming from the island to uh, to New York City, um, not only it was like to learn a lot more or expand my commitment as an artist, but as a commitment as a person and like, and understand that like our labor can change life and like can change the fabric of America. And this was like my first welcoming. <laughs> <laughs> French de Sade and like all the uh, Nicolas Dumit Esteves, Elia Alba, and all these amazing Dominican jerk artists. And so many of these artists also came through Altos de Chabon that you were able to connect with, or is that where the tra their training and their kind of know like knowing each other in the diaspora originated? Yeah, so uh, Sherry Sade and Ileana Emilia were both from uh, Altos de Chabon, um, as well, Carlos Montesinos, but Carlos Montesinos was uh, in the island at that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Gigi Polo is another artist as well, um, academic who does a lot of like design, graphic design and psychology. So all of them were having the first seat of like understanding design and art as an um, element of change from Altos de Chabon, but I like, continue this discussion um, and like this kind of like nurturing space in at Parsons that had like a more element of like, like critical uh, writing that it's like very, uh, like a bomb for me <laughs> because like you have the skills in Chabon, you have all these like magical colors around you, shape, forms. Uh, and then like you come over and the structure of the university give you that platform of like, okay, now what we can say with that, like how we can like channel this like powerful way of art making into a conversation of change. Uh -huh. I could see, I can see the ways you're radicalized by their work. <laughs> and I hear like you use this metaphor of like the fabric of that community, but can you talk a little bit about like the mediums that you're using? Cause I know you as a multidisciplinary yeah. artist and some of these artists influenced what materials you were using to convey this identity and experience? Yes. Um, so I think like this, like trans, like 
the fact that both of, both of the institutions are um, based on three big careers, like graphic design, fashion, and uh, art mm -hmm. or fine arts, it's like very engraved in the process of thinking that like you go from one medium to another, like you have a very strong like design aesthetic of graphic aesthetics, like this, this color blocking, this like sense of having like precise like typography and then like this exploration with fabric, even though like you can like be a painter, but like you decide which fabric which kind of canvas you want to use, like which that was the way that you want to uh, stretch it. If you don't want to stretch it, you know, there's all these like things that I think like, because like Artos de Chabon and Parsons as well have like these like three big points in the institutions. Like it make us as well, like just operate that way. I work with performance art mainly. Um, I always like work with performance art since the island, but at the same time, like being, having this like transition into uh, New York City that have like a very strong like garment district that as well have a lot of Latinx history in it. Like make me use a lot of that aspect, like the, the performativity of like, having garments on you, the performativity of being a Latinx person that have history in that specific industry, navigating the, uh, the street. So a lot of that comes from this experience that I have in the transition and it permeates like in my work, I have like pieces as like Lady Walk, that you have this conversation of like, you know, being a performer artist that like, is like talking about labor, is talking about this like, very fascination of the color textures, like the sound of bubble wrap, the sound of silk, the, you know, the touch of like maybe puffy or like, you know, like this like kind of, how can I say, como peluche? It's like a, like a teddy bear yeah. uh, coat that yeah. that's like very, I think, that's like something that I got from memories like this like need um like interacting with these things and like creating shape with these things and performing with these things because from the memories of seeing my grandmother mm -hmm. in queen's plaza with a fur coat or a mink coat um and understanding that like i never wore that in the dominican republic because it was like cold weather but like understanding this like flawless of this like woman that i working in labor and on sunday they are having their best they are like able to like work and feel beautiful i think well yes. can you give us a little hint of, about your own family migration because you're talking about the your grandmother's relationship mm -hmm. diaspora and your own yeah so um I, migration is a big uh part of if not the center of my work because um my work is like first dance and dance as movement and movement as migration and migration as the relationship of the body with the landscape. So my grandmother is my muse. Mm. She migrated from the countryside of uh, Dominican Republic, from El Cibao, from Santiago. Uh, and she already has some sort of like um, a Spanish like lineage, mm -hmm. like in her blood. So like, for just taking her like she already had movement on her blood and then she migrated to the city uh and she um had like uh, this beautiful like marriage with my uh, uh grandfather who has like part of like afro descendants like from his side so there is a lot of like things like happening already there but then like with the political pressure in the like 60s and 70s and like shortage of like um work over there in the Dominican Republic, they both like immigrated to uh, New York City and she was working como una trabajadora en casa, like a domestic laborer. He was working in um, a restaurant industry, lavando plato, like washing dishes, like doing line cook, doing construction. Uh, and that sense of like, you know, pride in like building their own house, like from remesas, Mm -hmm. And having that security for their family, I think like that kind of like, you know, choreography of, you know, like 
providing for mm-hmm. like feeling pro- unprovided and not looking down into this work it was permitted to me it trans kind of like una, una cosa como un poco espiritual I don't know yeah, if I can yeah, say that entiendo lo que está diciendo. but yeah but that's the relationship that I have like and then like her back, going back like having New York City as a space to grow but at the same time going back and having the responsibility of bringing uh you know like continue continuing like growing up with her children uh and going back and forth in like uh visiting like the other like family members that were in New York time to time mm-hmm. um and then like my other like family members como tíos and tías that then like when my grandmother in the 90s like were back into Dominican Republic they decided to leave and they decided to start like another generation of like abreus in Dominic and in New York. So there is like certain like aesthetics that I see uh-huh. in fashion and in art. Uh, I think like the Fania and all this like aesthetic of the Fania, this like activism that it was like translated in the in, in the lyrics and the fashions as well. Like mis tíos, like they left in the 90s, like they were like very engraved with that. And like that was like as well passed to me as like my grandmother in the mink coat. <laughs> That's another type of aesthetic, you know, zapatacones, like like campanas, like pants, and like that like clean cut suit, like the Fania ones. So yeah, I think like all these influences, like I think like I have more influences from my family and their own way of like absor- absorbing the world that I have for like actual artist well, I, I, I see that yeah. in you know like we talk about that Julia Santos Salomon as well with typography and like a lot of like textile work and multiplicity yeah I see it I see it because it helps me to then recognize not only the materials you're using but the the visual conversation that you're in with all mm-hmm. the repertoire that you're drawing on that's very obvious <laughs> by your family members. So that's mm-hmm. wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, you know, one more question. I I know it's a sort of a big one, but I'm really interested in your work around like gender and identity as a mm-hmm. gender studies professor, like how you're navigating that and even what you've said here around thinking about beyond the island is much more space for you to express gender and sexuality in different ways. Can you talk about in your work how you're exploring gender um yeah yeah I think like it was like our conversation in the island 10 years ago it was a breaking point for me Mm -hmm. uh because I started to like realize that maybe I was not identifying as a woman Mm -hmm. maybe there was something else that I didn't have you know like there was no writing whatsoever that we're talking about you know non-binary at that time in the island. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that was liberating to me when I migrated and I started to like see people that were actually saying like, yes, like I don't have to be a transgender person to like, you know, like be something else. Like, yes, and I, as well, like I can be a transgender person and like, like have this other identity. I felt like I, I was a non-binary from the get-go Mm-hmm. But I was having a very strong femme spirit and like femme like force. Mm-hmm. So it, it was not only till like maybe like two years ago that I started to like learn about femme and femme as not as a gender, but um, as part of. It's like I identify as a non-binary femme person. Mm-hmm. And um, I just started to like, unpack that through my work you know like there is like a uh, size 5w is the first one that I start to try to exemplify how these like elements of craft and craftsmanship and migration were emblematic for me to see my gender fluidity so I have this like very chunky um platform shoes that I crafted, like multiplying the size of my feet. And uh, in the craftsmanship of this, I was thinking about my grandfather. I was thinking about this masculine energy that I have being as a sculptor, you know, like I am not into like making only soft things. I'm not interested only in like presenting figurative work. I was really into machinery you know, like cutting, 
<laughs> making holes, like shaving, you know, like all these like very, so I started to like see this like femme, mm -hmm. this femme energy through that. So I decided to like perform with the shoes and I started to like think about prosthetics. So prosthetics is very important in my work because like I started to like perform with and with and in mm -hmm. well like these like pieces. Uh, so size five W it was like this interaction in between me trying to do like the first steps of ballet because I was a, a dancer in the Dominican Republic as well since I was a child. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to like do the first steps of ballet and trying to like untie these shoes that are tied to my own body mm -hmm. through this like very silky, um, como se dicen, listones. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to even like say it, maybe lace. Yeah. Lace. Okay. It's like a silky lace, like with the same color of my skin. Mm -hmm. So I had like this transition of seeing like, I don't know how I'm feeling. I want to like take you out. But at the same time, I want to like craft this like beautiful interaction in between you and me mm -hmm. and this energy. And then like I moved with Lady Walk, which is like maybe like my most explanatory like uh, piece where I also have a conversation with myself and my mother and Diana Ross. Uh, in a word document where like I'm performing this like three, you know, designer, labor person and appreciator and, you know, impersonator of a um, model in a wrong way that I craft. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, on top of this performance that is dividing us at theater, I am having this conversation about um, just like being myself. So I'm like trying to like uh, use love hangover the Diana Rose like okay. uh, song yeah. to say that I don't need to be cured, you know, I don't need to be cured. It's just like my being and I just like feel wonderful to have like this identity and navigate the world with it. Mm -hmm. Um I think like uh, this one is very complex, but I didn't want to leave this like word dog life situation where like the word dog as well, like it was like trying to like change my Spanglish because it was like, no, you don't fit here. It's English or Spanish. So this like live recording of like me as well, like <laughs> typing it down and the system kind of like juggling and saying like, no, we don't understand what you're doing. It was like reaffirming to me that yes, like I'm a person that it was completely non-binary, <laughs> no, even in the language, not a non-binary person, Spanglish person. <laughs> so you have to create your own terms then, always mm -hmm. creating your own terms, which I mean is certainly something that, you know, when we first spoke a decade ago, yeah, I was learning that as well. I was learning from you and your experiences of the body and how you navigated all these spaces. Yeah, and there is nothing else for an artist that is not world making. Mm. We are world makers. Like <laughs> we, if yeah, I think like questions are the only thing that an artist can depend on. Yeah, everything is like manageable, but like unique questions and like <laughs> that will drive you somewhere. Well, what I'm hoping is that these conversations, the series of conversation with Chaboneras, um, are asking a whole you know case of questions that. Uh, some of us scholars here in North America haven't explored and that hmm. will be, we'll have the opportunity to be in conversation with you about like how that space can be a spark, but what you've already described is how that space is already in movement and mm -hmm. always movement and, and that, you know, all the things that you have to offer kind of visually and intellectually can't really be contained on the, by the island or yeah. <laughs> in that kind of education, but it, it certainly became a connector. Like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a connector. I think in the in uh, in Chabon when I was like living there, you know, Chabon was like made on top of a indigenous cemetery. So it, it is impossible to not talk about like our presence with all the spirits that are there in sacred land. And I think like my conversation in Chabon as an artist was that this like. Uh, my one of my uh, aunts, like dread aunts, like died of cancer during that time when I was like graduating from Chabon and I was like not present in the Dominican Republic when she was transitioning. Like she away from me, but like at the same time, it's like 
we live in this space and understanding as well that like as a process of creating is a process of acknowledging our presence. I think I learned that from Chabon, mm -hmm. that like we were absorbing not only colors and shapes, but as well people's life. And we needed to like be very conscious on like how we can like continue talking about this, like whatever we go that we need to preserve that. Chabon has an archeological museum over there to talk about that. And I think it, that was like very important to me. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, I can tell this is really just the beginning of a, a broader conversation, but I'm really excited that we'll also have a chance to kind of have, present like a live round table with you and Shahedesade mm -hmm. and Julia um, de Santos to hear from folks and ask you further questions. And then people can find your work online. Yes, they can find my work online. They can also like follow me on Instagram because I'm very proud of like sharing not only mine, but as well like all the works that we're doing collaboratively, especially like in the museum field as well, like it's another like big point for me. So we can continue like this like journey of representation mm -hmm. and uh, creating like visibility for our Latinx stories in the U.S. Wonderful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Abrazos. <laughs> Thank you everyone for sticking around and joining us for this and um, be in touch or let me know if you have any questions you want us to carry over or come to our next uh, meeting where we have a live conversation.